Hello, everyone. Thank you so much for joining today's AIW Los Angeles Las Vegas sex section uh, town hall meeting uh, right before the uh, Christmas. And uh, today we have a very uh, uh, distinguished speaker and very uh, exciting topic. It is going to be fun. So we uh, encourage you to have uh, uh, to enjoy the meeting and have a very interactive, interesting conversation. Uh, but before the, we start the program, uh, just uh, some announcement. Uh, for folks online, uh, if you have any question, please click raise hand on Zoom and uh, wait for a uh, speaker to get ready, uh, or it's better at the end doing Q&A, but if the speaker doesn't mind, uh, you can ask a question in, in between. Uh, but please respect the speaker's uh, uh, pace of presentation. Uh, he has prepared a very fantastic slides. Uh, so uh, it's good you enjoy it first. Uh, if you want to type in Q&A, that's fine, but then the, uh, the priority will be lower because people cannot hear you directly, but we'll do our best. Uh, you can put also in chat for networking, but uh, it's better you can speak out your question. Please click raise hand to get a microphone access. Uh, for folks online here, we have uh, this beautiful long tail library. Uh, really appreciate it. Uh, it's really fantastic. It's a very nice room. Um, and then the restroom is right outside of this entrance. Uh, if the librarian didn't see you, you have to wave your hand uh, to them so they can open the door because it's locked. Uh, they can uh, click and they can open the door for you. Um, of course, officially, there should be no food uh, in this room. If you have any trash, please, uh, outside in the library entrance, there's a trash can. Um, there's also a water fountain over there. Um, and if you're really, really hungry, you need coffee across the street, just 30 seconds walking, there's a corner uh, corner burger. Uh, have coffee and uh, yeah, hamburger if you want. And uh, the other thing is, uh, because we only have one microphone, this is for the speaker, so the speaker can repeat the question, but actually the microphone is on the TV. Regularly, if you speak out, uh, people online should be able to hear you. So it shouldn't be a problem. But if it is a, uh, they cannot hear you, um, folks online, especially Charlie Bono, uh, uh, Colonel Bono, Charlie, please let us know you cannot hear us. And we will do the best using the microphone. Uh, so a few words about Adderbury. I'm talking about try to wait for more people to join online. Um, Adderbury, as you know, is a nonprofit organization. Uh, uh, also professional society, so we have journals, uh, books uh, for people to write articles, papers, and uh, public, public books. And uh, we also have national conferences like Ascend uh, in the summer next year, will be combined with um, aviation. Also SciTech is January 8th to January 12th, just right after the new year. That's a national event. Uh, for the local chapter after this one, uh, the next town hall meeting presentation is going to be January 20th, uh, which will be the, in the same long tail library for hybrid events and talking about the first two decades of human space flight. Uh, and then followed by January 27th uh, by, by Michelle Evans uh, about the very uh, uh, inspiring and a very uh, sad story about Mike Adams and the story of the pioneers for XPT. So we have more event coming up, but uh, we will announce it gradually. Um, so I think it's gradually into the schedule. So our speaker today, uh, Mr. Ren Simberg, is a very experienced aerospace professional. Uh, you already saw his uh, bio online, so I don't want to repeat everything, but just some highlight. Uh, he used to be a manager, um, project manager in Rockwell International. Uh, here in the uh, in Downey, and uh, he also work uh, work at the Aerospace Corporation here in Los Segundo. Uh, he is expert uh, in this uh, space transportation, orbital transfer, 
uh, space tether and lunar resource utilization. And um, they, they turn out to be uh, um, uh, move on to a career for being a book author, speaker, freelancer, and uh, he is the founder and president of this uh, uh, company. Uh, very interesting, called the uh, in Integral Space Science. Uh, so you'll hear a lot from uh, from from the speaker today. Uh, so it's a great opportunity we can learn from uh, speakers' expertise and the years long years of experience and his opinion, uh, which is very vital for. Um, uh, all the space activity right now. Uh, as you can see, this month, space is going to test again for Starship. Uh, Subotic is going to launch their first um, lander ever for America to get back to the moon uh, after Apollo 17. So it's a very exciting time, but at the same time, there are a lot of things to consider. Uh, so our speaker today will explain to us. So without further ado, let's welcome uh, Mr. Ren Simberg. Thank you, Ken. Uh, you're probably wondering about the title slide, uh, why it says the book is by me, but the presentation is by Stephen Fleming. Uh, this is actually a 10 year old presentation and it was put together by Steve Fleming, who is uh, at the time was doing uh, commercialization, the technology commercialization at Georgia Tech. And he's currently doing the same thing at the University of Arizona in Tucson. Uh, but he put this together for DragonCon in 2014. And so it's not really an engineering brief. It's more for lay audiences, uh, you know, not, not a lot of charts, or graphs, anything like that. I do have a few that after this presentation that I will show uh, to talk about some of the more specific engineering issues. Might need to turn it a little or something. I'm not sure. Yep. <coughs> okay. Uh, that couple. Uh, so a little history of how the book happened. I, I, I call it an accidental book. Uh, I started a pro I was very concerned about this time uh, about NASA's risk aversion in terms of the, how safety is the highest priority. And we passed the uh, uh, the name of the uh, CSLA Commercial Space Launch Act amendments in 2004 specifically sort of to allow commercial human space flight. Uh, and, and at that point, at the first, at first we had what we called a learning period before, so FAA wouldn't be regulated uh, for safety. Because they were very concerned that they really didn't know how to do that. Uh, and in fact, uh, that learning period has been extended several times. The idea was that we would get some experience and then at some point they would have enough experience where they could say, Here the, here's how we should design these vehicles. But uh, things didn't happen for a long time. Uh, Blue Origin, Virgin Galactic were long delayed. Uh, they didn't, they really only in the last few years started to fly with any kind of regularity. And it's not really, it's still very, very rare that they fly. So we still haven't, we haven't learned or, or done as much as we anticipated when we, and I was involved in helping draft that legislation when we, when we first set that up in 2004. And, uh, Defines and define what suborbital so meant. Uh, but the main thing was to say that yes, FAA will continue to be responsible as it was with an uncrewed launch uh, to make sure that the safety of the public is safe, uh, will ensure the safety of uninvolved third parties. But they don't do mission assurance on satellites and they don't do SNMA, uh, safety mission assurance, on, on human space flight. So I, but, but I was concerned at that time that NASA's uh, risk aversion was going to bleed over into the commercial industry. So I decided to start writing about it, and trying to make to get some of the message across that we have to accept risk or we're not going to make progress. And I think you know, SpaceX has certainly shown that. He is, he is a risk taker, and he's moved very rapidly to change the world. So, so I actually did a Kickstarter, and I raised, I think I might have raised more than this, but that was a, a kind of a snapshot in time. Uh, I raised money so I could pay myself to take time off to write the book. And uh, the contributors got a free book. So any kind of new form of transportation is dangerous. And in fact, I don't, I don't know if people are aware of this, but Magellan started out 
in Seville when he went around the world with five ships. He came back with one and he didn't come back with it. Just one, one lived into Seville with the skeleton crew after the trip all the way around the world. Uh, Magellan was killed in a battle in the Philippines. In fact, uh, the first person to circumnavigate the earth was this navigator who was from the Philippines. He had actually gone west to, to Europe and then he got then he navigated from Magellan. So when he got to the Philippines, he was the first person to actually been all the way around the world. But the point is, uh, most of the expeditions lost. And that was just the way it was back then. There were all kinds of things that could go wrong at sea. And, and all of them did, they had mutinies. But, you know, they had, had to deal with uh, uh, pirates and other things. Doesn't want to move. And uh, I just described uh, what happened to Magellan. So any new form of transportation until we really learn how to do it, people are going to uh, be injured, they're going to die. You know, we went out west, a lot of the settlers didn't make it. And when, then we started using uh, steam for transportation. And it started out with, with the, uh, the steamboats, and then later the railroads. And then we got the automobile. We kept on coming up with new ways to kill ourselves in order to get around. And you know this this has resulted, of course, in a lot of regulations. Now we have traffic signals, we have stop signs, we have speed limits, we have all these things. We have we have regulations about you know, how how cars brakes should perform, you know how they should be designed, how much redundancy they should have. But in order to learn about all those things, you have to go through different experience. This is actually James Dean's car. This is the first time I've ever, ever actually seen. Uh, I've driven by there many times. It's it's uh, east of uh, I the name of the town, but it's up up on the central coast. And he was driving a Corvette, crashed into a tree. So, and even now, we still have auto accidents. And of course, then we started to fly. And we, we did the airmail for a while, and the government was doing it. And eventually, they shut it down because too many pilots were dying, but then it, came, it became privatized. But it really did provide a good market to help develop aviation in the beginning. So this is sort of the history here. We apply only in completely safe conditions which that means there's a lot of times you're not going to fly. Just as today, but there's a lot of times you don't launch because the condition of weather is not right. And then we had this. Uh, people think that the Hindenburg caused the death of the airship business, but it was on its way out anyway, because airplanes were getting so much more efficient and better and faster. So an interesting fact about that, the Hindenburg, people think that people that people died and were burned from the hydrogen, uh, when in fact it was from the diesel and the engines. The uh, hydrogen just goes up. It didn't really, uh, didn't affect people on the ground or, in the, or even in the vehicle. And then we had rapid advancements, of course, with the war. Uh, we were cranking up new designs, I think, P-51 was developed in something like going from drawing board to the first flight in some ridiculously short amount of time. It was less than a year, I think. And then we learned how to do it on ships. And a lot of people died doing that. Not, not just the, the pilots, but the ground crews, the, the deck crews.
and we only really learned how to do it relatively safely in the 1980s when they came out with the, uh, the Hornet and the Tomcat. So that's the number of people who died in non-combat. From when we first started flying jets off, that's until we we got the, the new air, the F-14, the F-18 in uh, in the 80s. So uh, the point is that when something's important, you're willing to risk lives, and clearly this was it's national security. And when even during Apollo, well, for Apollo, in fact. Just said we're going to have a speaker next month on, on the X-15 and Mike Adams, who's buried up in the desert. And this was a program that uh, didn't survive. And then we lost three people in the Apollo fire because it was important to get to the moon. And they made some mistakes, and which were, in retrospect, were obvious. They shouldn't have had a, a full atmosphere, pure oxygen cabin. The, the ironic thing is it probably wouldn't, they would have been okay if they'd been in space, because it would have been much lower pressure. So it wouldn't have, it wouldn't have been as uh, volatile a situation. Recording in progress. And this, this is uh, the aftermath of the fire in the capsule. And the three men who died, Shira, uh, Chappie and uh, Grissom, not in that order. So Apollo 6 was, uh, didn't fly anybody, but it was the first flight of the Apollo, of, of the uh, Saturn V, and it was a disaster. It was, uh, they lost engines, they had pogo, they had structural damage. But they sat down, they looked at the telemetry, and they figured out uh, what all went wrong, and they figured out how to fix it. So then we had Apollo 7, and they had issues on that. But then on Apollo 8, which was really the very next flight uh, after, after the disaster of the first one, uh, they sent men all the way to the moon and around. They didn't land because they didn't have the lander yet. That was going to be a few months later. But this was, was uh, 68. It was 55 years ago, Christmas. And the point is, NASA could not do that mission today. It just was too, would have been deemed too risky. Uh, in fact, uh, the administrator resigned because he didn't want to do it. And Tom Payne came in and he said, yeah, let's, let's do this. Because they were, they knew, they were afraid that the Soviets were going to beat them. And they'd already flown animals around the moon on the zone. And they were, they were concerned that they'd lost so many firsts to the Soviets. The Soviets had the first man in space, first First satellite in space, first man in space, first dog in space, first EVA, first two people in space. Uh, they've been beating us at everything. Uh, and, and this was really, uh, we figured everything's ready to go except we don't have a lander. So let's just fly around the moon. And, and we can beat the Soviets to doing that. And they did. And then we started to land. And in fact, we really won the race with Apollo 8. If people think it was, oh, it was Apollo 11, that's when we actually did what we said we were going to do. But the, the, the Soviets quit racing after Apollo 8 and after the M1 blew up on the pad. They didn't, and then they started pretending they hadn't been racing. But that was that was when when we really won. But on that first flight, that first um, crewed flight, you know, Neil and Buzz thought they had maybe a 50% chance getting back. And then we had Apollo 13. And Apollo 13, we were very lucky not to take anything away from all the daring do and, and the brilliant things that they did uh, to get that crew home. But they were lucky if it had happened on the way back from the moon, if that tank, oxygen tank had exploded in the, in the command module on the way back, it would have died because they wouldn't have had the limb as a backup. 
And then, but that was the point where they really decided we've got to quit doing this or we're going to kill somebody. And that's where the risk aversion really started. Of course, then we had uh, people died on the ground. Most people forget, but uh, three people died uh, when they were operating in a pure nitrogen environment. And they didn't realize it. So they basically asphyxiated and didn't realize it because you don't, you know, your body doesn't recognize uh, that you're not getting oxygen. It can re it recognizes that you're getting too much carbon dioxide. That's that's what creates the suffocation reflex. But if you're breathing pure nitrogen, you just at first you get nitrogen narcosis, which is very getting getting high basically, like divers do sometimes, rest from the deep, and then you die. In fact, they just and I've always wondered for years why they didn't do this. They just started using this as an execution method, where they just put an oxygen a nitrogen mask on someone. Like they're doing it in Alabama. Of course, uh, looks like most of us are old enough to remember Challenger. It was 40 some years ago. Uh, I was actually in Downey working at Rockwell that morning, and we had uh, <laughs> there was a kickoff of a of a meeting between the Air Force and NASA and us. We were one of the contractors for these new what they call the space transportation architecture study, which is to, uh, there's been an ongoing uh, battle fight between the Air Force and Marshall Space Flight Center about what the next vehicle should be, what was supposed, supposed to come after shuttle. So basically the, the White House said, said knock heads together, said you guys get together and do a study, have, have industry do a study and figure it out. So uh, we had, Knock Rockwell had a contract, uh, Boeing had one. Uh, I think General General Dynamics did. Uh, so anyway, this is a kickoff meeting on the morning of January 28, 1986. We were having a kickoff meeting in Down for it. And one of my colleagues came running in, you know, as they were getting it about to get started. Have you ever heard the expression, white as a sheep? He came in, he said, Soda Boche, I just saw a Challenger explode. He, he was coming from the Mission Control Room. And over in building six. And you kind of see the news move through the room. People started getting up and going to find phones because they didn't have cell phones at the time. They had to find a phone to call, you know, Florida or Texas or, or Alabama as they start to make a range of flights to go home. But, you know, that was a, a remarkable influence of events that caused that. It's, it's often, it's, you know, the shuttle is a very highly complex, tightly coupled system. And those are very prone to catastrophic failure. And if, if just one, it was kind of like, the same thing was true of the Titanic or the Donner Party. If they'd just done one thing right, they would have been okay. But they did everything wrong. And in this, with the shuttle, there, if the weather hadn't been so cold or if the, uh, if that leak in the joint hadn't uh, gone and uh, you know, flared the, with that uh, torch on the strut where it did, if they hadn't had the winds aloft, um, if any one of those things hadn't happened, they would have been okay. And we might have flown quite a while longer, not realizing that the shuttle was, in fact, a very unreliable vehicle. That's the picture, the iconic picture, like everybody saw. And it was like the worst possible mission for that to occur. Because it had the school teacher on board. Because everybody said it's safe enough to fly a school teacher. And every, so all, so, you know, millions of kids, school kids were watching. It happened live. So it probably traumatized the generation. And again, this is what contributes down to NASA's risk aversion. You know, they don't want that, they didn't want that to happen again. But it did happen again. And when Columbia came in, I should say, we used to look at the, we had all the fall trees and everything could go wrong with the shuttle. 
county and, and we calculated what is the reliability, what are the odds that we're going to lose one. And they were much higher than NASA liked to say publicly. But you couldn't really criticize the shuttle in any way because, because and even among management at Rockwell, you couldn't really do that. They were Apollo veterans who developed this thing and you told them there's probably the shuttle was like you know, telling a parent that their kid is ugly. But we knew that there was a, it was a very high risk that we were going to lose one. And, but we never predicted, you know, we, we figured an engine is going to blow up or it's going to lose tides or, you know, there are lots of potential failures, but we didn't anticipate the weird string of events that led to the loss of, of Challenger. This one we did predict that you can have some damage, some structural damage to the tiles. You don't have integrity for entry and the vehicle burns up. And it was at that point that they decided they had to cancel the program finally. But the thing that people don't understand is that we didn't cancel shuttle because it killed people. We actually had lots of astronauts. There was no, there's no shortage of astronauts. There's lots of people who are willing to be astronauts even if they think the risk of dying is high. People are like that, and they, if they think something's important, they're willing to do it. But we, but we couldn't keep flying shuttle because we only had five of them. And then we had four, and then we had three, and we didn't have tooling to build anymore. And you, you got to a point where you just couldn't, uh, didn't really have a program. You didn't have a part. They were cannibalizing uh, one, one vehicle to, to another in order to keep flying. So it really was not a practical program. So the point is it wasn't, it wasn't uh, canceled because it wasn't safe. It was canceled because it wasn't reliable. And you can't have a reusable vehicle that's not reliable because the cost of reusability, uh, cost, cost of uh, unreliability is too high if you, if you intend to keep your vehicle. So this is the crew from Columbia. Now, a point I like to make, if somebody on my blog once said, uh, you know, if we wanted to show that we were serious about space, you would set aside something like Arlington. And say, this is where all the people who are going to die opening up this frontier are going to be interred. Now, NASA actually does have something like that down at the Cape. It's the uh, Space Mirror Memorial. And on it are the names of people who have died uh, in space or get it, trying to get into space. And there's room for playing more on it. But it's, it's important to recognize that we do, we are going to lose people. And it's unrealistic to think that we're not. Recording in progress. Uh, this was pretty spectacular. We didn't really learn about it until the 90s at the Soviet Union fell. We got access to a lot of the documents. But uh, it was an a explosion in Baikonur of a, not still not clear if it was supposed to, I think it was supposed to be a Mars probe. But they had, it was caused by a, a, everybody, a lot of people around the pad at the time. So it killed a lot of people. Uh, it happened because there was a timer uh, that went off prematurely and ignited the second stage. That's, that's how, how they're staging back then. But the Soviets lost people. These, these three died when uh, the valve uh, didn't stay, that stayed open on entry before, before they got into the atmosphere and evacuated and they didn't have suits. So that's the title of basically the title of my book. The safe is not an option. And it's not doesn't just apply to space, it applies to life. There is no safe. This side of the dirt. Every every decision you make, every action you take carries some kind of risk. You know, you don't know that the next breath you take is going to have cyanide in it. And it doesn't mean stop breathing. Now Huddle Hubble is an interesting case where it had to be serviced, but they didn't. And this was after after uh, Columbia, and they didn't want to. People don't realize if Columbia had gone to ISS, uh, it, it would have been okay. They could have inspected it. They could have decided, well, it's not safe to bring this thing home. 
they didn't go seven to eight, just to hang out there and send up another show. But they didn't go to more going to ISS. They were just in a probably a 28 degree orbit of just due east out of the Cape. And, and they were doing science experiments and other things that didn't have anything to do with the space station. So they, just, they had no place to go. They had no safety haven up there. And so because of that, and Hubble's in that same orbit, uh, they didn't want to, well, Sean O'Keefe, who was the NASA administrator during when Columbia happened, uh, didn't want to have to tell any more family that uh, their loved ones were killed in space shuttle. So he said, God, it was too risky to send somebody up to fix the, the Hubble. And he canceled, canceled the rescue mission. And of course, there was a huge uproar from the astronomy community about that because Hubble's been giving us a lot of uh, data and still is. And then Mike Griffin came in in 2005 and reversed that. Uh, and pe some people argue, well, for the cost of that mission and considering the risk, uh, we probably could have built a better space telescope and launched it than to do that rescue mission. Uh, but again, it's the, kind of an emotional thing an irrational thing, but people said, no, we, we want to fix up. Uh, so they reversed the decision and they did end up flying. It was one of those times when which the astronauts, the ones who, who were scheduled for the mission, actually did recognize and say, yeah, sometimes we have to risk our risk lives to make progress. I do this one hand. Oh, that's good. Um, so anyway, uh, that's that's the kind of uh, risk and reward that NASA has to do and has to do more of. So that's just a picture of the deep field. I just told that story. Yeah, so as I said, shuttle, shuttle was canceled because it wasn't reliable. It, it, uh, there was too many compromises that had to be made because of the budget situation that they had in developing it in the 70s. And, and the, other, the other problem uh, with it was it wasn't fully reusable. It was only partially reusable. Um, and ironically, the, part, uh, the parts that weren't reusable caused both accidents. In the case of the Challenger, it was the SRBs. Now, they, they say they reuse them. They don't really reuse them. They re rebuild them. Uh, you know, basically, you, you get back. To, they got back the uh, segments, you know, empty, empty segments, and they have to put them back together with new field joints and, and repour. Uh, so I call them more rebuildable than, than reusable. <laughs> but, that, but one of the failure, one of those joints is what uh, destroyed the Challenger. And in the case of uh, Columbia, it was the external tank because the, the vehicle wasn't designed to be hit by ice as it was taking off. So in neither case was the orbiter, the reusable part, the cause of the accident. So to me, that sort of validates that reusability is a good idea if Elon hasn't already done that abundantly over the last decade or so. So with Space Station, we had, had some interesting issues in terms of safety. Yeah, we had we almost I shouldn't say almost lost space station, but um, in 2011, about a dozen years ago, there was a failure of the Soyuz uh, on a cargo mission, and it was it was kind of sounded complex situation because they had you have to understand until Crew Dragon started flying a few years ago, they couldn't have more than six crew on the station because they only had because they insisted on having lifeboats for everybody. And the lifeboats were basically Soyuz capsules. They had to have two Soyuz at the station at all times. And so as a result of that failure, they had to delay another Soyuz launch until they could figure out what, why it had failed. And, and they got in a situation where they had to go down to a single crew because they didn't have a lifeboat for uh, only three on, on the station because they didn't, didn't have lifeboat for them. 
And at one time, they actually contemplated maybe abandoning the station if they couldn't uh, get things going in time, which could have been catastrophic because the station is not designed to be flown without crew. Uh, all kinds of things could go wrong with it that you might not be able to recover from if there's nobody up there to maintain it. But the other thing to understand about station is, uh, and most people don't realize it, but of, of those six people that were crewed with the station there, uh, five of them were keeping the station flying. Which meant only, there was only one person available for research. So we were only getting, the, the research is essentially the reason we built it, but we were only getting one person here per year. And if they, when they went to seven, that meant that they doubled the productivity of the ISS. So if you think, okay, suppose they were working on some kind of drug and it, it turned out it would save thousands of lives, maybe millions, but they didn't discover it because they had to, only had one researcher working. They didn't, they didn't have enough people to come up with that. And the reason that they wouldn't have done that was because they were afraid of risking a crew person. Because they wouldn't, they wouldn't have like both six, they didn't want to have seven, even though the station from whatever one went operational in the early aughts was uh, it could handle the life support system could handle four, seven people, four on the uh, U.S. side and three on the Soviet side, the Russian side. Uh, but what we went without that extra person for years until we could have until we got the crew dragon flying, which could bring back seven people. So that's the cost of risk aversion. Now compare it to what we do at the, at the South Pole, at the uh, Emerson Scott Research Station. People winter over there, and they cannot get out during the winter. There's no way to evacuate them because the weather is just, uh, the winds and the cold and everything. There, there's no vehicles. Uh, we can just get them in there. In fact, people have gotten sick. Uh, Jerry Nelson, Nielsen uh, came down with, uh, she was a physician, fortunately. Uh, I think she was the she was the physician, and she got breast cancer, and they did manage to airdrop some medicine to her, but she couldn't be evacuated until until the spring. And uh, so, but she did survive, and she did later die, but but she lived several years after coming back from the heart attack. But the point is, we don't have lifeboats for people down there. And you know, I suppose you could say, while well, NSF should spend billions of dollars developing something that can get into that station in the winter, but they don't do that because it makes no sense. But that's the attitude that we have to the space station. Okay, I'm just going to skip through these. So on the very first flight of drag of, of cargo Dragon. Ken Bowersock, my point is, he, well, he said you could have, could have saved people on that mission. Uh, he said it would have been a nice ride. It, you know, it went up, a few orbits, came down, landed in the ocean, uh, all within the, the, the biggest difference between uh, that. I mean, they made a lot of improvements when they went to crew drag. But the fundamental difference is they put in a life support system you know, for thermal management and, and uh, you know, Error, that sort of thing. But the point is, if it had been important to get to ISS, they could have done it with the with Cargo Dragon. But it was important. It was more. Uh, they weren't. You know, it, they should have been important because we we're giving. We gave Putin millions, tens, hundreds of millions of dollars during that time period from when he retired the shuttle in 2011 until Crew Dragon was flying. And gee, wouldn't it have been nice to stop that sooner than we did? Now, in 2009, there, there, uh, Obama kind of inherited a problem called Constellation. It was, it was slipping more than a year per year, and they were trying to decide what to do with it. And so they put together a, a commission led by Norm Augustine, who would Done, been the head of such a commission prior to that, but he's, he's famous in the industry for a book that he wrote back in the 80s called Augustine's Laws, which I highly, highly recommend. It's still <laughs> very relevant. It hasn't changed much. 
as is unfortunately my book. So, so they had to say, what are we going to do with, with Aries 1, Aries 5, and Altair, and Orion? And, and they recommended what the Obama administration did, which was to uh, develop commercial capability of getting people into space. And this is also something important, uh, because this hasn't really been stated explicitly uh, in NASA, but the, if you're not going, if you're not going to expand humans into the solar system, stop wasting money sending them into space at all. Uh, but con the Congress didn't like it because it didn't necessarily send uh, the taxpayer money to the right zip codes. You know, they, they wanted to stick with what they had, and that's how SLS and Orion survived. So I'm not going to spend a lot of time on SLS, uh, except the main point about it is that it's really a remarkably insane program. It's like it's practically not any any level at which you look at it, it makes no sense. They they took engines that were designed to be reusable and they figured out how to throw them away. For example, um, they're putting up putting things up on you know they didn't learn any lessons from the shuttle in terms of using solid boosters. Uh, for a human vehicle, and and it flies so rarely that in between flights you're going to forget how to fly it. And so you can't cannot, cannot have a safe system with the kind of tempo that you have with SLS. It's sort of like it's that time of year, right? You go get out your Christmas lights and you take them out, you know, untangle them, figure out which ones work, which ones don't. You know, it's, it's like flying something every two years, just sort of like that. I'm not sure exactly. It's a hard chart to read, so I'm not going to talk about it. But it was basically, it's, the reason it's called the Senate launch system was it was designed by two senators, one of whom is now currently the administrator of NASA. And I won't, I don't know whether to talk about the Apollo cargo cold or not. In the, during, after World War II, or during World War II, uh, all these, the Micronesian islands, you know, were kind of invaded by all these, these British and Americans. And they would come in and they'd clear a jungle, clear out a land strip. These giant silver birds would come in, carrying mana from heaven, you know, cigarettes, candy, canned goods, all this stuff. And then a couple of years, and this is the, the first contact. This is like a pre-industrial civil society. It's the first contact with modern industrial civilization, right? So they, after that, they all left at the war. So they said, they kind of shake, what happened? So they decided to try to replicate it. They would build uh, airplanes like this. They would build, build thatch control towers in hopes that the big silver birds would come back. So it was called a cargo cult by the anthropologist. Uh, this is a quote uh, from Jeff Grayson, who was at that, that time he was CEO of Export. Uh, and, and it wasn't just him that said this, it was he and Sally Ride said this in a press conference. That if, if you just gave, uh, and, and when he says the program, he's talking about constellation. They, even even if they, they had it, all the development costs behind them, they still couldn't afford to fly it with the budget that NASA, that Congress was willing to give them. Uh, fortunately or unfortunately, Congress is, was willing to give them enough to keep everybody working. So I already mentioned how, uh, you know, you need, you need to fly more often if you're going to have a safe vehicle. And this, again, this is a 10-year-old slide. But it's, it's kind of held out. We know we know we spent over $20 billion on the program now. And we got one flight out of it. So 
you have to fly a lot to actually get demonstrator reliability. Now, I'll talk about this more after after this presentation when I go into the last few slides. Uh, but you're not you're you're not flying enough to maintain proficiency, and that is those both those reliability and proficiency have implications for safety. And Steve Steve Squires pointed this out also several years ago. Uh, so it took us about over two and a half years to get back to flight after Challenger and almost as long to get back to flight after Columbia. And uh, again, that just emphasizes you know, why we had couldn't not keep the flying shuttle. And I made the point earlier about how rapidly the P-51 was developed, uh, 117 days. <laughs> And we just can't do that anymore. And the Air Force is starting to worry about it. Space Force is starting to worry about it. That we can't, and it's not just the Navy's worry too. We can't build ships as fast because they've been shutting down all our shipyards. We can't keep up with China. So the question comes down to how do we value human life? How much is it worth? The government actually has numbers like that. They they use for coming up with regulations for say for auto. You know I don't know what the current number is. I think uh, I think it's got to be. It's not a million. I don't think it's on, probably on the order of a hundred thousand, maybe a couple hundred. Uh, how much? How much? You know they want auto. They should make automakers spend you know, to reduce the number of people killed in cars. And the same thing with aviation. And you know, so does, does the flies become more valuable when we put them in the air? Do they become more valuable when we put them into space? It's not clear why. You could say that, yeah, okay, astronauts have more value than other people because we invest a lot of money in training. Right? And, they're, and they're harder to find. You know, they're, they're, you know, two sigma individuals. That, but you still have to say, how much should we be willing to spend to save an astronaut, to not kill an astronaut? And, and the way NASA behaves, basically, it says, their price is no lot. We'll spend as much as it takes to make sure that nobody ever dies, which is not how you advance any industry. So that's Mike Rowe, you know who he is. Uh, He's kind of ranted about this stuff uh, himself, talking about how if, if, if safety and I say if safety is your highest priority, that says actually doing what you're trying to do is a lower one. So that's unfortunately history, and we've seen Dragon True worked. Again, this is a ten-year-old chart. This is the state of the industry in roughly 2013. And at the, kind of the point here is, we're sort of at the, the, where aviation was in the 1920s in terms of knowing how to design space vehicles. Uh, in the 1920s, they didn't know how many wings a plane should have. They didn't know whether the, the control surface should be on the front or the back. You know, it took took a while, and it took a lot of experience, and it took a lot of accidents to figure all that stuff out. And, uh, and every FAA regulation, aviation regulation, is written in blood. But we're not doing that in space. And we have to. But Elon is starting to. He's doing at least not with people. But he's willing to break, to fly things and break them and figure out what went wrong and fly them again. So was, the Commercial Space Flight Federation was heavily involved in. in Writing that, you know, coming up with that learning period. And in fact, there still are Karina Trees, who's the head of it, is still testified before Congress recently that yes, we have to. It expired in October. They extended it in the latest uh, uh, omnibus, but that was only through till January. And the industry is still arguing we need to keep that moratorium in place. But others, people at the Rand Corporation and some other places, have been arguing no, we need to start regulating. And, and I, I will simply disagree with that. And 
And so the question is, and people always say, well, we, we have to regulate because if we ever have an accident, it's going to destroy the industry, which I think is nonsense. But we did, we, if we are an informed consent regime, and that, that means that you, you tell people who are flying, here's all the ways you can have a bad day on this vehicle. And then you decide whether you want to fly or not. And that's how people are flying with Blue Origins, how people are flying with Virgin Galactic. It's also how, it's how people are flying uh, at these commercial flights on, on Crew Dragon. But no, accidents don't kill industry. You know, people still take cruises after the Passport Concordia. So what, what is the role of the government? Uh, it's not regulation yet. Uh, but at some point, there was an interesting article in Space News uh, a couple weeks ago, I think, saying, yeah, we do need rescue capability. Uh, this is not the official, the official motto of the Coast Guard is Semper Paratus, always be prepared. Uh, but the informal motto is, motto is, you have to go out, but you don't have to come back. And we need something like a, a space guard, an equivalent of a Coast Guard. We need a space guard that has the same kind of attitude. And, and they'll procure their own vehicles, or, or they'll just go out to commercial industry to you know, sell them custom vehicles, which is what they do with their ships. You know, it'd be nice if you could actually have it as a, uh, a uniform service, like the Coast Guard, it'd be an adjunct to the Space Force, and it would, it would you know, become part of it in times of war, which is the Coast Guard does to the navies. Um, but that's the kind of attitude we have to have. Send people out, recognize their risks, try to mitigate them by having them possible to go out and rescue them if they get in trouble. So I think that might be the last chart. Yeah, and the book is available, still available. Uh, it's it's print on demand at Amazon if anybody wants to buy it. Yeah, I think that is the last one. Switch to the other. Yeah, you want the page? Yeah, I want the other. PowerPoint. Okay, so this, these are some charts I threw together yesterday because I want to talk about more detail about stuff that wasn't in this original uh, original briefing that was written by somebody else 10 years ago. Uh, but uh, NASA's approach to safety is, is fundamentally irrational. Uh, it's, it's driven by politics more than you know any kind of sane systems engineering. And I have a few slides that kind of goes into the, into these details, but basically, it's they have unrealistic goals in terms of loss of probability of loss of crew. Um, I want to say instinct for the capillary as opposed to the jugular. I mean, they 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 will focus resources on some aspect that's not that dangerous to begin with, while ignoring much more hazardous things. Um, and and they because they do things so things so seldom. You know, they spent 10 years, more than 10 years, depends on how you define it, when they started SLS, because it was really like the next, they'd already sort of started at Aries 5, which was, SLS is sort of a descendant of, but it's been, you know, it was over a decade to develop it without a single flight. And all they could do is, in terms of assessing around the liability was doing PRAs, it's not rather than flight experience. Uh, Elon has flight experience. SpaceX has flown, I forget how many now, but hundreds, I think hundreds of flights, and they have a demonstrated rising and profitability that I think reliability is very high. And and the other thing is you'll see these detailed PRAs, and they'll have like five digits of precision, and something one of the factors of which they don't know they barely know within an order of magnitude. And you know that's the first thing they teach you in engineering school. You know don't use more figures of of uh, 
decision than you have. And they have an arbitrary loss accrued requirement. I think it was 271 to 270, I think, just for commercial proof. Where's that number come from? Phil McAllister told me sometime, one time, you don't want to know where that number comes from. But I'm sure it has a lot of astronaut input. But the point is that it's arbitrary and it's unverifiable. You know, how do you verify that that vehicle has a 1 in 270 probability of loss accrued? So I apologize for the quality of this chart. It's a figure in the book that I had to blow up. But it kind of describes where, sort of where these numbers come from. So on the left, you got crew safety per launch. So 1 in 100, 1 in 1,000. Turned out that shuttle was about 1 in 100. Just as demonstrated, we lost that many crew out of how many we flew. 1 in 10 is probably, that's like Russian roulette. But you might still do that if the mission's important. If you're sending people out to prevent an asteroid from hitting the Earth, you might send dozens of people out knowing that only a few of them will make it through. But that's what you do when things are important. So the target was 1 in 1,000. And this was sort of the justification about why we had to have a crew escape system. And again, it's thinking from the 60s in Apollo. We have to do everything the way we did in Apollo. That even, you know, when Mike Griffin announced Constellation in 2005, they called it Apollo on steroids. Because the problem is we got to the moon with Apollo. We did it the worst possible way because we were in a hurry. But somehow it's become the paradigm. It's become, it's the existence proof. And there's, it can't be done any other way. And another point that he kind of changed his mind because the question is, we don't have rescue capability for a satellite. We'll put up a billion dollar national security asset on these rockets. And one time Griffin, prior to becoming administrator, he said, you know, he had asked about if we, how can we fly humans on Atlas and Delta? Delta IV, Atlas V. And he said, well, I can't think of anything I would do to those rockets to make them any more reliable because they have to fly a billion dollar Pentagon satellite. It's got to be a reliable rocket by definition, whether you want to call it human rated or not. The only thing that makes a vehicle human rated is for it to have an abort system and for the rocket to be able to tell the abort system it's time to abort. That's what, that's what human rates a rocket. Because people say, well, Falcon Heavy isn't human rated. Well, yeah, if you put a crew dragon on top of it, it's human rated. Okay, this is all this. So this is what was driving, trying to get to these numbers, trying to get to minimize probably loss of crews, which we have to have. Yeah, we have to have one of these. We have to have an abort system. Now, I was doing some contract work for Orbital Sciences. At the time, they were the contractor before Northrop bought them. They were the contractor for the for the LAS. And I was doing hazard analysis. And we found that there were about 60 hazards on that thing that could give you a bad day on a nominal flight. So in other words, and one of like the most obvious example, failure, failure to jettison. If you don't get rid of that thing, when you're done with it, you're going to die. Because you can't enter that way, the parachutes can't open. And so you could have a flight that's going perfectly fine, except your board system, even though you didn't need it. And it was never obvious to me, I never saw the analysis that said it actually improves safety, overall safety, but this doesn't introduce more hazards than it removes. And I think the reason is, I don't think anybody ever did it, because basically, I think the thinking was, well, it won't look like a pile if it doesn't have one. And I don't want to go to Congress and explain why somebody died because they didn't have an abort system. Not occurring to them, they might have to go to Congress and explain why somebody died because they did. Uh, 
but here's another point about the misallocation of resources. And by the way, that, that thing weighs 14,000 pounds. It doesn't, it doesn't cost you 14,000 pounds of payload because you don't take it all the way to orbit, but it still costs you a lot of payload. And, and expense and cost. And you throw it away every time. You hope you throw it away every time. You don't even want to use it. It's a, it's a very expensive insurance policy. Uh, but this is a lunar mission. Um, so basically, NASA went and they, they looked at how are all the ways you can, you can die and what's your probability of doing so for each phase of going to the moon and coming back. So the biggest part of that pie you can see is you're most likely one in four chance of dying on the moon, doing something on the moon. Uh, landing is a danger. The other, the big one is is returning in the what the time they were calling the crew exploration vehicle, which is always a silly name. I thought you're not exploring crew, uh, but that was that was prior to it being named Iran. They were calling it CDV, and so you have a 20% chance of dying on descent. And you have about a seventeen percent chance of not doing the proper inje injection in, in the earth. But so if you look at all those, ascent is three percent. Three percent of the total risk of a mission to the moon and back is on the rocket going into space. And yet they were spending billions to make that safe, while they weren't spending anything on anything else. They weren't spending any money on the launcher. They weren't spending. They were spending very little. I guess they were, they were doing that CEV, which became Orion. But but it, it seemed like a gross misallocation resource to, to worry so much about how to get into space when we know how to do that. We've been doing it for 60 years and not be spending any money on how to make the rest of it safe. And that might be it. I just thought I want to get a little bit more into the engineering uh, since this is AAA. But that's basically what I, I mean. I could talk a lot more, obviously, uh, but I'm certainly happy to take questions now. I think there's a desk chart. Yeah. Yeah. So there's, a, there's just three charts I built yesterday in anticipation of this event. So any questions for folks here? It sounds like you're advocating a Coast Guard. Can you speak a little bit Sure. It sounds like you're advocating for a Coast Guard. A, a Space Guard, space yes. Guard. Yeah. There, uh, I highly look up Google, uh, if, go to the new Atlantis.com. I don't know if you're familiar with the new Atlantis. It's a quarterly journal of technology and society and ethics. And I've written many long essays there. Uh, but about 12 years ago, a colleague of mine, a business, business partner, uh, wrote a, an article called, I think it's called Our Coast Guard for Space. So I highly recommend it because he describes you know, how that would work, why it's necessary, how it would improve things. Uh, but we do need some sort of uh, something to perform constabulary duties, you know, go out and inspect the ships, you know, are they up to spec, do they have, do they have uh, proper rescue things, uh, you know, the same sort of things the Coast Guard does down here, we should be doing in space. And and I, would, I could give a whole other talk uh, on, on the subject of why it, the best place to base that would be an equatorial lower orbit. Uh -huh. That's cool. Because it, that, then you have access to anywhere, but it's the most responsive possible place in system in space to be, to be able to get anywhere yeah. quickly. And the only problem with that is that we don't have any equatorial launch sites. But I think in the future, that's four degrees off. Yeah, it's supposed to do a dog leg. Yeah. And the, but that's not ours, it's France. Yeah. <laughs> and, uh, but I think the solution is going to be when Starship starts flying, they'll start doing sea launch because they, they'll want to do that anyway, point to point. Yeah. And so we'll do that from the equator, you know, launch, launch uh, from one platform. Land the booster on one downrange, which maximizes your payload so it has to fly back. Uh, and that and, and itself it self varies. You just fuel it up on the on the one that you landed it on and fly it back by itself. So, so that's a whole separate 
subject. But I do think that that's the future. Most things should be, most things that don't have to be in some other inclination should be uh, in equatorial. Yeah. It sounds perfect. Yeah. We do need a maintenance crew. Yeah. So, so I, I highly recommend reading that uh, that essay. Because it, it kind of lay, it lays out all the issues, the problems that we have with the current structure between DOD and of course this was written for Space Force, which really isn't a force. It's a it's a core. Let's be honest. Um, like the Army, like the Army Air Corps was before it became the Air Force. But Trump wanted to call it, have a space force, so they call it space force, even though it's a core. But this, so this is all before that. And things a lot of people got confused. There was a lot of discussion about this in the last decade or last decade. People got confused about the difference between whether a space guard and and the space force confused it even more by calling calling them guardians. Any other? Yes, uh, I, I have a question. Uh, that was a very interesting uh, retrospective uh, presentation. Thank you. Uh, my question is, how do you think uh, risk assessment uh, will be sort of uh, uh, quanti uh, quantitated in terms of uh, uh, the volume of, uh, of crews? I mean, in the, in, even to today, the, the maximum number of, of uh, passengers in any one uh, uh, mission will be, I don't know, maybe uh, at best, uh, uh, half a dozen, something like that. Uh, not even that uh, with current technology. But now you, you're you're talking about uh, Starship, and and projected uh, passengers of maybe up to uh, maybe a hundred passengers. And so, how do you think that uh, volume of passengers might affect uh, sort of the evaluation of uh, risk assessment when you increase the number of potential? Well, obviously, the bigger the vehicle, the higher the loss. If you if everybody on it dies, uh, I, I don't think. And, and Elon himself has said, you know, we're not going to fly people on this thing until we've flown it a lot. I mean, he's, you know, he wants to deliver Starlink with it. He wants to. He wants. To, but I think at some point we have to get kind of more in an airliner mode. Um, he's going to. He's going to have a reliable vehicle. And I would postulate that SpaceX has the most experienced rocket design team in the world right now. And I think they're they're going to fly that a lot. I think people don't understand is that the, the big advantage of reusability is, A, you can do incremental flight tests with it. Is that, you know, you've seen people, I mean, now in China, they're building hoppers. Uh, uh, what's the name? Stoke, not Stoke. There's another, there's another company up in Washington that's building a fully reusable system. Uh, and they're they're hopping. They just did a hop the other day, so you can do incremental flight tests with it, and you can fly you can fly every day, as opposed to expend a little. It's a very expensive thing. You fly it once and you throw it away, and you hope you get from telemetry how what can happen, what can work. But when you fly something over and over and over again, you can get it to reliability that's fairly going to be fairly comparable to airliners. So and and you know we don't. Uh, getting back to the abort situation, abort system, do we really need an abort system? You know, we don't give airline passengers parachutes. Because it, it just doesn't make sense. They have to wait, they wouldn't know how to use them, they wouldn't be able to get out. Uh, at some point, we're going to say, why are we uh, wasting money and weight on these abort systems? When you look at SpaceX's Falcon 9 record, for example, and there are plenty of people who'd be willing to fly. I would. I'd be willing to fly without an abort system. You know, that's look at you know space is hazardous. This this is the you know this is the harshest frontier we have ever faced in our history. And you know we came down from since we came down from the, the trees onto the savannah, but we kept on moving. We moved across. We went to the Arctic. We figured out how to go to all these other places. And now we're going to some place where there's no air. Right. And how do we do that? Well, well, the same way we did it conquered the Arctic. We did it with technology of fire. Furs, weapons. So we'll be doing the same thing in space, but we have to accept that people are going to die when you open up the frontier. So I, I don't know if I answered your question. Or not. Uh, obviously, it's a it's, it's a bigger disaster. It wouldn't kill a lot of people. It wouldn't kill a few. But what I would say with risk risk assessment, that, that's the other thing that drives me crazy about NASA's approach is they say. This is the probability loss of crew we want to design with it. 
and we want to queue and rate it, whatever that will mean in the future. I think it's an obsolete concept from the 60s myself. And I wish people would, I wish you could purge that phrase from our vocabulary. But you should, you should don't, don't do a PRA and say, did we get to this goal? It depends on what you're doing. Again, if you're going out to save Earth from an asteroid, you're going to take, be willing to take a lot more risk than if you're doing kids' science fair experiments, which they were doing on Columbia, right? So for any individual mission, and I'd like to get out of this notion of missions as well, uh, it's just a place where people are doing stuff. Uh, so, so for any given activity that you need to perform, you say, here's what the probability of, me, of it, my having a bad day, Herman bad day, and am, am I willing to risk that for what it is I'm trying to accomplish? Uh, but NASA is not allowed to do that by Congress. Even though they sort of did with Hubble, that was one of those rare instances where they actually did that. Okay, so AC, is that okay for you? Uh, yeah, that, that sort of has a question. And, and I'm sorry, my name my name is Adrian, and uh, I, my apologies for not uh, mentioning my name. Uh, thank you. Appreciate it. Thank you so much, AC. Uh, so, uh, Mr. Martin, Mark, uh, Mark Rockway, do you want to speak out your question? Yeah, okay. Hi. Um, I've uh, heard you give this talk before, and it's... Uh, and actually, I was in attendance at the uh, Augustine Commission uh, uh, meeting in Huntsville when Jeff Grayson uh, made that statement that you had. And um, I couldn't agree more about SLS. Uh, it's uh, incredible. Uh, but um, I've been exposed slightly, not, I don't know a lot about it, but I've been exposed to the Navy sub-safe program. Now I'm wondering what you think of that, uh, if you're aware of it. I'm aware of it, but that's all I am. I don't, oh, know, yeah. I don't know anything about it. Um, but I'm sure there are lessons to be learned. Particularly, yeah, we, uh, I was at Northrop Grumman when we were competing for CB and we, uh, at the time, we had just acquired the uh, uh, bunch of the shipbuilding. So we had an opportunity to have some of those guys come in and talk to us about it. But it was, it was basically uh, um, trying to figure out, you know, if something went wrong, how could you get back to the surface was, was, was their focus. Yeah, you know, there were, there were stories. In fact, I think Rob White wrote a book about that, about World War II. It was a fictional, but basically, you know, you, they open the hatch and you just make sure you don't hold your breath. <laughs> just let the bubbles flow as you rise. That depends on how deep you are, obviously. But I, that brings up another interesting point that in terms of what's going on right now in terms of regulations, you know, there's this kind of battle right now going on between the White House and Congress over who, who should be regulating orbital activities. And, and uh, the White House Space Council just came out with a proposal and said, well, FAA should be put in charge of orbital transportation, on orbit transportation, but, but give commerce uh, regulating facilities, you know, like the commercial space station. And, and uh, I disagree with that. I don't, I think I wrote an article, in fact, I think it was in the New Atlantis uh, several years ago called Keep FAA's Head in the Clouds. I don't think they belong. I don't think they should be regulating anything in space. And I do. And I do want. We do. And, that, and so Congress pushed back on that. Senate pushed back on that this week, saying we we don't we want to have a one stop shop uh, for people to go to to do things beyond the atmosphere. And I agree with that. And I think it should be commerce. Uh, Commercial Space Flight Federation. Karina thinks it should be commerce. Uh, I think that's kind of the way that Congress is, is leaning. Uh, Rich Del Bello, who's head of the Office of Commercial Space, um, for, he's, he's focused right now on sustainability and debris and that kind of thing, which is an important thing. But he needs he needs a bigger remit. He needs a bigger budget. 
but but I so remember though that uh, you know there's there's overlap because even um, even with Starship, uh, it could be that their biggest market is point to point delivery on Earth. If that happens, that would be an FAA responsibility. Then yeah, now you got a mix, you know, you got FAA doing that part and whoever this other group is doing the orbital part or the in space part. Uh, I don't know. I would, it'd be nice to have one. And I've worked a lot on space planes. And there, there's a lot of overlap too. If you're trying to land on a commercial runway, do you have to deal with the FAA for that? But you have to deal with somebody else for orbital work. And well, we're de we're dealing with with mixing, you know, launch and airspace already. In, in fact, the aviation industry, airline industry, pretty unhappy about having to divert or wait or do, you know, go around the Cape when they're doing a launch and they're coming up with ways to mitigate that, minimize that. Uh, but, but obviously integrating air, you know, space with the air, airspace, um, you know, is, is an important thing to do and there have been a lot of papers written on it. But the other thing that's happening is in, in the midst of all this is that, you know, NASA wants to certify in the same sense that they certify uh, SpaceX, that they certify commercial crew, they want to certify these, uh, what they call them, commercial LEO uh, CLDs, commercial LEO, I forget what the D is, but it's the commercial space stations, which they have to have to come up with an acronym for, of course, they're commercial space stations, but they want to certify them for NASA use. And I think that's nuts. I don't, NASA, that's way out of NASA's lane. Uh, NASA is not a regulatory agency, and they shouldn't be certifying any anything commercial. That, that was a mistake, I think. It was, it was a bad precedent to let them do that with commercial crew. And and I've actually been talking to Axiom and, and uh, Orbital Reef and Bass and others, saying, look, we need to have United Industry. Uh, industry has to come up with what I call building codes. You know, we need to develop our own standards, working with ANSI and and other organizations like that, NIST, uh, which again brings the Department of Commerce in, right, uh, to, to do this ourselves and, and not let NASA say no. Because if, if NASA is certifying things and that says, well, you weren't certified by NASA, so it's put you at a competitive disadvantage, in theory, maybe, if people believe NASA certification is a good thing or necessary. So that's kind of a battle that I'm working on right now. Certainly, uh... Certification is important. That's, and I don't think, um, you know, commercial airlines are not informed to risk. Uh, you have certified vehicles. Um, yeah. But it's the test of time. Um, the tremendous improvement in airline safety is, is undeniable. And a lot of that was due to the rigorous certification process. But NASA didn't do that. No, no, no. no. Okay. And and if, but I don't but I don't think FAA is the appropriate place to be certifying space facilities and their facilities. I I think we should be treating them more like buildings. You know, NASA doesn't say, well, I can't send somebody to the Sahara for this conference in Vegas because we haven't certified the Sahara for NASA use. You know, they just say you meet local building building codes. Yeah, okay. So NASA sends their employees there. We ought to be doing the same thing in space. I mean, space, people don't understand how different space is from aviation uh, in terms of you don't have the kinds of, of, it's different kinds of problems. And things happen more slowly there, which is a lot of reasons a lot of people think, and this has been argued at science fiction conventions for decades, right? That the, the rank structure in the Space Force shouldn't be the Air Force rank structure, it should be Navy. Because they're going to, a lot of space operations will be very much more similar to naval operations than they are to air. But uh, anyway, these are all very, you know, current topics right now. I've, I've been waiting a long time to see them actually becoming things that Congress is actually talking about. And I'm glad to see it happening, and I want to try to keep moving the conversation along in a useful direction that lets us open up space Rapidly. And, you know, Gwen keeps saying, and I agree with her, that people do not understand the implications of Starship. That even people in the industry, it's hard for people to get their heads around a, a vehicle that, particularly if it's going to Equatorial Leo, they could be flying every hour. 
know, there's no launch window to, to the equator. If, if you want to do single orbit rendezvous, you got a window every hour and a half. All right. So it's it's just a, it's 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 like the transcontinental railroad space. It's just a, a mass pipeline into orbit, and just people a few people are starting to think about what could we do with that. And it's not just putting up a satellite, uh, you know, putting a satellite on a launch system, launching it and go to where it's supposed to go and throw the vehicle away. It's, it's, it's just a mass pipeline to and from orbit. And everything that's going into or coming back to space ought to be going through that orbit, in my opinion. And I think that, I think that ultimately is what will happen. Well, certainly an equatorial orbit would be, a low Earth equatorial orbit would be a great place for a space domain awareness constellation. Yeah. You could look up and you could look down. I mean, you could look both hemispheres and you can see everybody. But uh, since Sea Launch has gone out of business, you can't get to equatorial orbit until, yeah, like you but, said, uh, SpaceX does it. Yeah, well, we have to do that. I call I call ELEO Earth's Natural Harbor. Yeah, yeah. I agree. Yeah. Okay, uh, looks like uh, Mr. John Decker. You posted a link. Do you want to speak up? Yeah, that, that was me, actually. <clears throat> Martin was asking about the essay, the oh. Coast Guard essay. So I was just oh, filling okay. that in for Martin. Very good. Uh, so AC, I saw you earlier, you posed a question about Osprey. Do you want to uh, elaborate on that? Oh, he, he just wants me to add, add a slide of the Osprey, I guess. Yeah. <laughs> Oh yeah, in, in regards to the uh, the recent uh, sort of uh, uh, accidents and the uh, and the uh, the the, uh, the aircraft being grounded, uh, and and I just I just thought that might have uh, might have added to your your uh, risk assessment uh, sort of uh, uh, presentation in in terms of uh, how that generally affects uh, military operations. I, I live about half a mile away from Miramar Air Base here in San Diego, and so. I, uh, they fly over my house all the time, so I'm quite familiar with them. Uh, so I was just curious. Uh, uh, you know, I thought it would be a, certainly a, a modern day sort of a, uh, uh, example. Yeah. Well, as I say, this this briefing is literally ten years old, and I, you know, I just I didn't even try to update it to current events. But as I say, it's still surprising how much hasn't changed. But it's also how much has. I mean, you know, SpaceX has changed the world, and I don't think it's almost like if, with a lot of the uh, the industry, it's sort of like the dinosaurs. They don't the asteroids hit, they don't realize it. Yet. And if you don't figure out how you're going to operate in this new world, you're not going to make it. It's really just hard to believe that you all and um, ESA are developing brand new. Expendable. Yeah, I mean, I, I told Clay Maury years ago that Ariane 6 was obsolete before, will be obsolete before it was. And then he went to Blue Origin. <laughs> so, so I guess at some point he realized I was right. Okay, uh, Charlie, Colonel Bono, uh, you post uh, uh, something on chat you want to speak out? There's a question here, uh, in person here. I think he was just pointing out where James Dean died. Okay. Oh, sorry, hi. Uh, sorry, Kufran Syed. I'm a, Can you say your name? Yeah, uh, Kufran Syed. I'm an uh, emergency medicine doctor training in space medicine. Uh, so you talked about NASA being sort of pretty risk averse. Do you feel the same thing is true for the FAA? Because um, as I understand it, it seems like the FAA is sort of you know, fairly reasonable from, from as an outsider, a fairly reasonable sort of approach to regulation in the sense that, oh, you know, you want to build an experimental vehicle, you're only going to kill yourself, okay. You know, you want to learn to fly, put your family in there, well, you know, there's some requirements, but like, you know, we're not going to be there watching you all the time. If you want to kill yourself, you do it. Uh, you can kill other people, hmm, maybe not. You know, all the way up to, okay, you want to fly 
you know, civilians on an airliner, right. okay, now you need 1,500 hours, and, yeah, and that, know, that yeah. sort of tiered of protest, they seem quite reasonable, like, what, what's your sort of take on it? No, I, I, I do think the FAA does a very pretty good job with aviation. Uh, I wish that they weren't involved with, with launch. They didn't used to be that when, when we, it's aging myself more here, but the, the original Commercial Space Launch Act was passed in 1984, and I helped draft that too. And and the, originally, Courtney Stad was the first head of the Office of Commercial Space Transportation, and and he reported directly to Elizabeth Dole. You know, that office reported directly to the Secretary of Transportation, and it did that up until 1993, when in some sort of streamlining government thing, the Clinton administration put it under the FAA. And so you had an immediate clash of cultures there. And when I talk about this in the book, I, and, and periodically, I, I know that uh, Jim Bridenstine was recommending this, and other people have, and I recommended in the book that they ought to fix that. They ought, they ought to be moved back. Uh, so reports that become, that become a politically appointed position, that's one downside of it. But, but it would report directly to the secretary, and it wouldn't be. As I said, I discussed in the book, FAA is, uh, you know, safety is that they used to have a dual role of both promoting safety and promoting the industry. And they lost the promoting the industry role uh, after ValueJet, perhaps in the Everglades back in the late 90s, if you remember that. And, and Congress basically said, no, you're going to promote safety here. And, but that's a diff, but it's the role of, Office of Commercial Space Transportation still, which is now they call it AAST, but still the CSP, it's still their role to promote the industry. So they've got a, a clash of cultures. There. That's another reason I think it shouldn't be, uh, well, it shouldn't be under the FAA. It needs to develop on its own more organically the way aviation did. It's, you know, we killed a lot of people learning how to fly safely in the 20s, the 30s, the 20s. Uh, and, and also, the NACA was very helpful uh, in developing that and developing the technology, much more so, more than NASA has since it, NACA got absorbed into it, because everything got screwed up by Apollo. And NASA became an operational agency, uh, rather than one that was supposed to be developing technology for instance, to serve industry needs, which is what the NACA did. So there's, there's lots of things that have gotten broken. <laughs> but in aviation, so much of the development was done with, for military uh, aircraft. Yeah, I think things. You know, it was much harsher environment. I mean, I tell my launch buddies all the time that at least you don't have really smart people trying to shoot at you. You know, it's it's it's, it's really hard to develop a you know a tactical aircraft. Yeah. And let's hope we don't let them start happening in space. That was probably inevitable. Humans being humans. But the, but that that's what pushed the you know, I used the wrong term, but well, it pushed the envelope of aviation so hard, you know, to for warfare, uh, that it made the commercial part, you know, certainly dragged along behind it pretty uh, well. We don't have that with uh, space. I don't know. Yeah. Well, it's just the, the peculiar way that space happened initially. And then, uh, because we were in a hurry to do it, to, to get, get be able to get satellites into orbit, we just we said, well, we've got these missiles, so let's just put stuff on, and stuff and people on top of them, and which was never a great way to get to space. Uh, but we got, got stuck in a very deep rut for a long time mm -hmm. until and, and when people wouldn't couldn't believe that you could actually reuse a launch system, uh, even though we sort of don't, or you could vertically land one. You know, we demonstrated that 30 years ago, you know, with DCX out of White Sands. And and I'm somebody with money uh, who wanted to really reduce the cost of getting into space because the government's never really been that concerned about that. As I said, I've, I've been I've done so many transportation studies and. It's just taken as a given that we're always going to throw the vehicles away, and it's always going to be expensive. And get, you know, can we do? Can we get higher flight rates? Can we get? Can we reduce the cost by half? Um, 
you know, a point I always make with the ELD program that it doesn't, and it's something I discovered in staff was that it doesn't matter if what what your vehicle design is if you don't fly it much. And and you can have a kind of a crappy one, but if you fly it a lot, you really do see cross. That's how you get cross down is by flying a lot. Flight rate is much more important than anything in terms of, of actually increasing access, increasing reliability, uh, and reducing costs. And Elon's figured that out, and he cleverly figured out how he can do flight tests on operational missions, because the customer doesn't care what the first stage does after it separates. Yeah. Right? Well, I agree with you 100%, but you know, as, as late as 10 years ago, there were serious articles published on that there was zero price launch rate elasticity and, um, and that going into reusability and lowering the cost would not add to the launch rate. And, yeah. uh, and they're 100 percent wrong. I mean that, but but some of that's a little artificial. Uh, Elon is his own customer with the Starlink, and a lot of his missions are you know feeding himself, or his launches are. But but still, uh, clearly reusability is the way to go. And I think it's also clear, I, I think the vast majority of the mass to orbit will go up on heavy uh, vertical takeoff, vertical landing launchers like, like Dr. Mine or, well, like Space uh, Starship. Hopefully New Glenn comes along and is ready too. Yeah, I've actually seen pictures of it finally in the barn. <laughs> Have you? Yeah. Just this this week, I think they showed some pieces. So, hmm. Yeah, so no. maybe maybe next year. And of course, the you know we all we all all those DCX guys, you know, they were the you know existence proof for all of that. And, and uh, but that's yeah. a whole other story of you know why didn't uh, DCX go forward? Instead, we tried to make X thirty three. Uh, yeah, X thirty three was a, was a disaster. I don't know what Gene Austin was thinking for that. If you don't, it violated Fresnel's laws of X planes. You know, one technology. You're you're testing one technology. You're not testing five. But it, it, what really influenced Elon was Massa. Because uh, you know they 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 did that uh, up up in Mojave. They did the, the flight where they turned the engine off and they then they relit and they landed. And John Goff sent because he was working at the, the mass at the time. He sent an email, a, a video of that to SpaceX. And that's when they went. And I've been telling him for quite a while, you're not going to enter that booster without slowing it down. You've got to come in hot jets. Because they kept on breaking up every time you try to bring it in, and they finally figure out, well, this is how we do. It. You know, we can do a vertical landing. Yeah, it was amazing that uh, you know, pulse of uh, breaking was you know not even was just written off for decades and decades. It's, yeah, you got an atmosphere, you got to use that. You know. Yeah, that's well, you know the old the three rules. Of design, you know, if you want to uh, cruise, use an air breather. If you want to accelerate, use a rocket. If you want to turn, use a wing. Uh, any more questions here and online? Okay. Um, <clears throat> so, um, Actually, I do, we do have, uh, um, before we end the program, actually, I do have something to say. Uh, right now, actually, our section, you know, Air Widow Center, the speaker section, has been um, actually working on uh, several events, several years about this launch safety. And right now, our public policy chair, Mr. Daniel Scalise, uh, he is the, um, he is working in the USC and Aerospace Safety Department. And uh, we are working on a uh, program with USC. I mean, it's not a program, it's an event uh, for launch safety investigation. Uh, so actually we are trying to reach out to 
people like Rain and uh, people uh, in, in those large companies. Uh, we are trying to get people together to discuss about this uh, uh, issue. Uh, so actually, it has been in progress. So uh, we'll keep working with Rain. Uh, so, um, so on behalf of the Los Angeles Las Vegas section, the other way Los Angeles Las Vegas section, we want to present Rain. Zimber Appreciation Certificate to thank uh, uh, there's a great lecture and uh, uh, wonderful presentation. So uh, let's uh, thank uh, Rand again. Thank you. Yay. Thank you. Well, uh, as far as uh, we understand, actually Rand has another lecture can give. So we hope we can work with him uh, for coming up. But again, uh, we'll stay in touch with Mr. Zimber for uh, uh, this uh, we're working on this air, uh, launch safety issue. Uh, we are trying to do it at conference, but uh, we don't know whether we'll reach that scale right away the first time. But we do work on uh, you know mini conference or just a, a meeting to get people together to discuss about it. So uh, thank you so much again for joining today in person online. So uh, people here can come to network. Uh, folks online, if you still want to speak out, you're welcome to do so. So thank you very much again. Appreciate it. See you next time. Happy holiday. Happy New Year. Thank you, everybody. Thank you. Bye-bye. Yeah, I just wanted everything wrong with SLS lecture. It just I think that would be really fun. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> no.